Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Ford. I work for a company called ThoughtWorks, um, and I'm going to talk to you about something that's completely different to that. Um, so I'm quite interested in the concept of uh, making music by writing computer programs. So in answer to the question of the title of my talk, I'm going to give maybe four ways that we can profit from using computational musicology. The really obvious one that programmers always get straight away is using computers to analyze music. Uh, a slightly less obvious one, but I think is really, really useful and productive, is to use computers uh, and computational information theory thinking as a way to produce music and produce art. Um, and the third one is that, as I mentioned, I work for a company, so I'll, like, uh, I'll maybe just quickly pitch that so we have an office in Barcelona now. So if you come to Barcelona for curry on, you're desperately looking for a way to stay here forever, we're hiring. <laughs> Right. So, just to give a bit of context before we get to the um, uh, the point where we can we can start asking questions, um, this is music, right? This is music notation. There's dots on a page. This is the way that Western musicians, in particular, uh, annotate what they do. So, you could use the techniques and the thinking that I'm going to describe to work with actual waveforms and kind of the the continuous or pseudo continuous properties of pitch and performance and lyrical meaning and things like that. I'm not going to start with that because that's quite a bit more detailed. I'm going to work with basically the natural numbers of music, so the dots, the discrete music. So if you don't know how to read music, it doesn't really matter, it won't really come up again, except for maybe the next slide, but just as a rough approximation, uh, each of the horizontal lines reads like a graph. So the vertical position of the dot tells you how high or low the note is, and the horizontal position tells you when it happens. So it's just really just a simple geometric representation. Um, so the key idea of the talk, uh, like kind of the key complexity theory idea of the talk, is the paradox that there are things that are really big, datum or data that's really big, that can be explained by a really small amount of code. So if you look at the expression here that I'm highlighting, um, that says in Clojure, a lisp, please print me a string of a billion Gs. So if you actually tried to store that as a file, I think it's actually considerably larger than the iTunes library. So it's, it's a big amount of data, but obviously I've been able to describe it in not very many characters at all. So, you know, that's kind of, I think, maybe we uh, look past it as programmers, but I think that's a, a kind of a paradox. But the way that uh, maybe complexity theory handles this is to say that the essential complexity of a datum is uh, defined by the length of the shortest program that can spit it out. So if there's something that you could write a hypothetical program uh, to do, then uh, and that program is really short, that tells you that there's a lot of redundancy in the, in the data. And it actually doesn't have very much essential complexity with a lot of repeated structure. If something takes a really big amount of computer program to write, that's almost the same thing as saying that has a lot of essential complexity. There's no way of boiling stuff down. So this is actually quite a similar concept to compression. So you could almost say that compression and understanding uh, are quite related concepts. Um, so if I, if I, well, I can't evaluate the whole thing, obviously, because it's far too massive. Um, but if I evaluate just that bit of it, obviously, we've got masses of Gs. That's 10,000 Gs. So it's another uh, G string, just like uh, Bach's air on a G string. So I'm using LIS partly because that has good facilities for making music, but partly also because we have macros, which lets us talk about both the unevaluated program and the evaluated program. So this macro here, description length, takes an expression, converts it to a string, and just counts how long it is. So that's, the, that's kind of, by definition, the length of the expression to produce uh, the data. There's almost a dual expression here, result length, that is not a macro, it's an ordinary function. So it evaluates the code and, uh, and then measures the length of the result. So we've got these two expressions, one that tells you how long the description is, one that tells you how long it expands to. Oops, let me expand that again. So uh, you can just look, for example, at this example of this expression here, where we repeat the G 65 times. So that only takes 13 characters to do. But if we were to expand that uh, string, of, uh, string of Gs uh, to the result, it takes 131 characters. So it's quite compressible. So you could say that the explanatory power of a particular expression, in terms of information theory, is the reciprocal of the compression ratio. So if you have a really small expression that 
captures a really large datum, then you could say that that uh, expression explains it really, really well. So in the case of this, uh, this little string of 65 Gs, it's got basically a 10 to 1. You can, you've got a 10 to 1 power to weight ratio. With 13 characters, you can describe it, um, but it takes 130 to actually represent it. And incidentally, this gives a really good definition for random. So randomness can be defined in terms of whether or not there is an expression that is shorter than the literal data. So if you've got no way to compress it by writing something that's smaller, we say in this particular way of looking at complexity that it's random. Um, so one of the problems with this kind of uh, complexity anal analysis, Kolmogorov of complexity, is that it's not computable. So there's kind of some paradoxes you could actually create if you could work out how to uh, have an expression that is worked out for any end data how long the expression would be that you typed it. So that's a little bit of a problem for using it. Right? Obviously, maybe there's use cases where we can work it out, but in general, things not being computable is a bit of a problem. Um, but uh, one of the things that David Meredith, who's a musicologist, worked out is that it's not with music that we necessarily care about what the essential complexity is. If we're a musicologist and we're trying to explain the music, what we care about is the quality of different ways of explaining the same piece of music. So perhaps we have uh, one way that uh, looks for certain commonalities in the structure, and that achieves a medium compression, but we have another way of understanding how that music is put together, and that achieves even greater compression. So it's a way of actually objectively measuring the quality of different analyses of the same piece of music. So David Meredith has this system where he actually uh, starts with the dots on the page, transforms them into numbers, and looks for common sections. So he's actually doing uh, automated analysis there. So you can see on the left, there's a few patterns of the dots where they repeat in the same way. So in this, this is taken from a paper called Analysis by Compression. But if you look on the other side, you can actually see it's not exactly the same dots because they don't happen at the same height, but they're repeated structure that can be exploited. So that's, I mean, that's a very interesting paper, um, largely because it, it does circumvent the problem of computability because we don't care what the lowest possible, the best possible explanation is. All we really care about is which of the explanations we have does the best possible job. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of an example of how to do that in, in closure code. So th this is the, uh, the rhyme, row, row, row your boat, which is like a children's rhyme. Um, and I'm going to build it out of closure expressions. Not literally, so not note by note, but expressions that expand to form the actual piece of music. So let me just um, find the thing to plug in, and I'll actually play it. This one. Yeah. So sorry for the buzz, folks, but uh, I'll try not to leave it in too long. So this is just being synthesized by code. That's actually running that piece of the code. Now, the special thing about Row, 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 Your Boat is uh, it's a canon. So in musical terms, what that means is there's two copies of the same melody, and they're played overlapping each other with a simple delay. So by using the fact that I can write functions that transform the data structure, I don't have to write the melody out twice. I can write it out once and then just use a, a, a translation to, um, to do it twice. So that means that this explanation of Roro Ro, Ro, Boat understands the structure of the canon pretty well because it achieves you know, quite a high amount of compression. So if we actually look at the ratio between uh, Roro Ro, Ro, Boat, the description, it took 275 characters. Um, but if I expanded it, it would have taken more than 2,000. So it's not quite as good as the string of 65 Gs, but it, it's pretty good because we're able to exploit the structure. So I'm able to defend the fact that that's a good explanation of that as a piece of music. Um, incidentally, uh, this analysis, as you might have picked up, is sensitive to what your starting language is. So that's one of the things that you have to think about if you're trying to apply this kind of analysis. So if you have a certain set of primitives in a language, you can write something more succinctly than if you have a different set of primitives. So simplicity in this particular case is relative to the set of primitives. Um, there's, some, there's some interesting things you can do with that, actually, um, because uh, depending on what your base set of concepts are, you can talk about how simple an idea is. So it's not really objectively simple necessarily, but it's simple relative to this base language. So, so far I've only really talked about analyzing music, almost as though it was a, a phenomenon that we could analyze in scientific terms. Uh, so what uh, uh, I also want to talk about is the production of music using these concepts. Um, and also not just in music, but in other art forms. So the Library of Babel is a, a famous uh, 
Borges story, where uh, there's this, effectively there's this massive library that has many, many books on the shelves. And the idea is that that library is actually filled with all the possible books of a certain length. So it's kind of a, like a clean star, and uh, if you're familiar with like regexes or things like that. So it's actually, uh, he's described a really complex data structure, i.e. a library filled with all possible books in a really simple description. And the paradox there is, which I find quite interesting from an artistic point of view, that the Library of Babel is kind of a TARDIS, right? Because the description of the story itself is much shorter than any one of the books in the library itself. So you can have those kind of paradoxes with complexity theory that are quite a small description, even can be contained in the output, but you have a very big result. Another really interesting book, work of literature that exploits these computational ideas is uh, Carl Sagan's Contact. So in particular, the bit I want to cite is the bit where uh, they have the number pi and they discover a message encoded in it. So obviously, we don't really know that much about the number pi, or maybe not obviously. We don't really know the patterns to the digits. We don't know whether every subsequence is present in pi or not. But uh, the premise of this story was that there was an, a race of people so advanced that they were able to uh, transmit a message by altering the structure of the relationship between like, the radius and the circumference of a circle, which I find quite an interesting concept. And the reason why I'm citing this is this is not an example of using computational thinking to analyze a book. I haven't done a word frequency analysis of contact, but the author, the artist, has used that thinking in their presentation. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about some uh, computational music that has actively uh, affected the world. So uh, this is one particular case that's very interesting by a UK band called Orteca, a band of uh, electronic musicians. Um, and by the way, if you're looking to ask questions, feel free to uh, kind of jump in. So we are into the, the question zone. Um, but there was, in 1994, there was a, um, an, an act passed where there was kind of a moral panic. So there was, there was a stage where there was a lot of dance music parties happening in fields. Uh, and the government wanted to ban this, but they had the problem where a lot of wholesome traditional British music is also done by people dancing around in fields. Uh, and so distinguishing between these two things became quite a, a, an interesting paradox. So what they ended up doing was defining them as uh, repetitive beats. So if the music had repetitive beats, it counts as a dance party and you're not allowed to do it. Uh, if it doesn't have repetitive beats, then it's presumably folk dancing or something like that. So what Orteca did, which I thought was fantastic, is they used kind of like a diagonal argument in a track. So they went through and created a, a piece where they had no identical beat in any one piece. So it still sounds like a dance music track, but they basically made sure that um, on no, no beat at all uh, was ever actually repetitive in a, in a computational sense. So it's kind of one up the complexity <laughs> theory of the bit. Um, but obviously they did have a practical eye to this. And, uh, you know, made people promise that they would uh, they would actually have a lawyer and a musicologist present, so that if it, you know people off their heads dancing in a field in 4 a.m., if the cops did come, they'd obviously have some trouble making a nuanced argument about about that. Uh, another interesting case, and this is where your base concepts come in, is, is blurred lines. Right. So um, there was a controversy because this song was found to have infringed on the copyright of a Marvin Gaye song, like too similar. But the trouble is we really don't have a very good idea of similarity in music, or at least that's not widespread. It's generally like what judges think is sounds kind of the same. Um, so uh, this was a case where perhaps if you had the idea of conditional common graph complexity, so uh, the idea of the distance between a particular datum and another, could actually be used to objectively uh, discover the difference between, uh, between pieces of music, which maybe could... Uh, not that, not that uh, blurred lines as it happens is a very kind of weirdly misogynistly uh, tainted tune. So it, you know, it definitely, I don't particularly mind that a bad thing happened to this particular song. But as, as, as a way of analyzing things, just having judges work out what the feel of a pop song that 18 year olds listen to is probably not very methodologically sound, I don't think. Uh, is there any, any kind of questions from what I've covered so far? Because I'm going to move into a slightly different section. Uh, this notion of compression. Yes. Um, yes, because I guess, uh, so the question was, is the notion of compression related to entropy? So if you have entropy, you're effectively unable to compress it because you have no way of explaining it. So if you had entropy that was just alternating digits, that was one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, you would be able to explain it, and so it would not truly be entropy. So yes, the Kolmogorov kind of complexity, is the idea is it's an actual essential, fundamental way of explaining what entropy is, you could say. 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you talk about, like, yeah, so you talk about uh, how, how big the program is that describes the pixel yeah. music. But then often, oh, sorry, um, often you can also use, like, functions that you defined. Yes. Or macros that you defined to yeah. describe the piece of music. So, how, so do you count the expanded versions of those functions, or do you just count the names of those macros? Like, what, yeah, what rules do you use? So the, the question was, I guess, uh, if you have functions that refer to functions or macros that expand, how, you, how do you define the rules? Uh, and I would say it's a little bit arbitrary. So as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. And in my case, uh, it's a very simple macro that just looks at the top level expression because I've deliberately not divided it into sublevels. But the proper definition would, of the Kamakura complexity would effectively chase down all the references you have to some base level. So is the base level a library of musical concepts that everyone already agrees they understand? Well, if that's the case, then you don't go below that, below that waterline. If the base level is the standard library, you don't go below it. If it's that, you know, if it's just scheme. So you get kind of similar relative results, but you obviously get very different absolute results depending on, uh, depending on how far you go. Um, cool. So I mentioned that uh, pi, we don't actually understand. Oh, sorry. Go, yeah. So you say you get different absolute results. Yeah. No, I mean you would. Sorry, you would. You would preserve. Well, generally, you would preserve the same relative complexity between two pieces. Although uh, it would be possible by choosing a language of base concepts to make a thing that you thought was complex simple, because it's simple when expressed in this. Exactly. So it's. I guess it's similar to compression algorithms. So if you're in a case where you have a certain, uh, you know, a, an image with a lot of flat color, then PNGs understand that in some sense and can exploit it really well. But other algorithms might not. But if you had something that was actually, I guess, a JPEG natural image, uh, a PNG algorithm would not understand that natural thing very well. Uh, well, this is more of an answer. Uh, yeah. so, the, so the usual yeah. uh, statement is that Kolmogorov complexity is uh, defined normally up to an additive constant. You can always prepend a translator from one notation to another as part of your program. Uh, and so it doesn't matter what notation you use uh, because uh, up to the constant of adding that translator. Therefore, as the song gets longer and longer, uh, the constant becomes dominated uh, by the cost of encoding the song. Um, but for short songs of the sort that, that you're yeah, looking yeah. at, uh, the relative order might very well change. Oh, very good answer. Thank you. Um, so the particular thing that I want to talk about now is other constants besides pi that are a little bit better behaved. So pi, we suspect, is a normal number. So we suspect that everywhere in uh, uh, every sequence of digits appears somewhere in pi. Uh, I, I think it's a, a, the same frequency. So it's something we speculate, but I don't think that's been, I'm looking for a hint of the audience, I don't think that's been proven. It's something that empirically we seem to come across. It seems random in that sense. Uh, but there are other constants that are also like the Library of Babel lexicons, or they're like the Library of Babel and they have everything inside them, but they're much better behaved that we can actually do stuff with, we can speculate on, we can, we can calculate on. So the one I want to talk about is, briefly, is the Champanan word. So this was discovered by Champanan, I think, when he was an undergraduate. Um, and really, it's just quite a simple concept. It's to take the natural numbers, serialize them digit by digit, and just concatenate them all together. So if we look at the uh, taking the first 16 digits of the, well, actually, the Champanan word, because we're just talking about the digits rather than the actual uh, fraction. But it just starts, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. So it's a very simple number, but you can also probably see from yourself that every subsequence of digits appears in that number because you can actually just get to that point in the natural numbers where you come across that sequence. Uh, so one conse uh, consequence of that is that if we can seed a process, artistic or whatever, from the Champanan constant, then we will eventually also hit all possible combinations so long as we have an appropriate translation. So as my own little kind of comment on uh, the way copyright works, but right? I've defined something I call the copyright infringement song. So it's kind of a decoding of the Champanan word, so into musical notes. So what that means is that as you play through the Champanan word, you'll eventually come up with every possible subsequence of other music. 
So what that implies is even though it's quite short, that it contains every other song within it uh, at some point. Uh, and so I was kind of thinking about the commercial possibilities of this. This is kind of a, a hidden profiteering. Um, I realise that I guess one of the downsides of this is that is in some non-legal, I'm not a lawyer sense, uh, infringes on the copyright of every existing song. Um, but I think that's probably offset by the fact that every future song infringes on its copyright. Uh, so as an investment, there might be a little bit of outlay <laughs> for the first little while, but eventually, I'd imagine, assuming that the recording industry wasn't completely disrupted by the process, um, it would become interesting. Yes? I would, I would imagine that it doesn't count until you actually yeah, that is a problem. I mean, I've played a bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you're saying, you're saying that uh, yeah, it doesn't count if you play it. Well, it's an, it's an interesting thing, but uh, does it have to be broadcast? I mean, if you think about a CD, it's an encoding of song. It's not the actual sound there. It's encoded in a certain way. Fixed in a tenable medium, I think, is the first Well, it's... It'll never be played, but you, you can also write it down and send it to the public office. <coughs> Well, I can, write, I can write down this program and send it to the copyright yeah. office. It's just a more efficient encoding, you could say. Um, let's try playing it, because it's it, at least at first, it takes, a, it takes a while as a song to warm up, so... Uh. <laughs> going in back some kind of cycle so we're back down to lower pitches and going back up. So basically eventually we'll hit we'll hit everything. So I guess if it, if I do need to do that I need to I need to get cracking now. I think. Um, one of the inconveniences of it obviously is if you like a particular part of this song that's going to take a long time to get there. And that's the particular part you like is the bit that we just listened to. Um, so there is a oh yeah, go. Oh, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, so I, yeah, the lawyer, I, I believe you. Wait, just, can you just, I believe you, but can you just, like, show me specifically so I know for sure? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good argument, yeah. So it works as a defense. Oh, yes. But there's another, uh, there's another dimension to this as well, yeah. to, to, uh, with the length of the notes, right? Yeah. So is it the same song if I go, row, row, row your boat, or if I go, row, row, row your boat? Um, are they the same or are they different songs? So I'm not an expert on it, but there is actually a difference between the uh, musical composition and the tangible output. But I think, so let's say, so long as a CD can infringe on the copyright of another CD, let's, let's assume we accept that's possible. So you know that you could use the same process to go through every bit combination on a CD, right? So in theory, so long as you accept that we're going to get discrete at some point, it's possible. Okay. But in the case of Blurred Lines, I think actually the controversy was that uh, one of the reasons why it's controversial is that Marvin Gaye hadn't registered the copyright to the composition itself, just the recording. But I think in some jurisdictions, the, the abstract discrete notes on a page representation can be distinguished from a physical recording of a particular version of it. So in that case, if I sang Row, 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 Your Boat with a slightly different voice or someone else sang it, it would still be the same underlying composition if we quantized it. And there is obviously judgment as to how close these have to be together. Entirely subjective and unreliable judgment, in my opinion. Cool. So um, in order to make this song more effective to work with, um, I, did, I added a skip to part of this, uh, this particular song. So you can skip to the part that you want, um, which is kind of convenient. So um, I've discovered something I call the Gay Williams Thick Constant. Um, <laughs> Which is the point that you have to skip to in the song to uh, to hear to hear blurred lines. So I'll just play that for you as well. the earth before you got to this and actually just playing it in real time. So the skip feature is definitely one that the users would be would be interested in. Yeah. I'm interested in how you yeah. 
this right, how do I, how do I come to it? Some people might have already figured it out, I don't know. Um, the, the key is that uh, the way I've turned the digits into music is uh, a predictable decoding scheme that is reversible. So uh, if I started with what the music looked like, that would allow me to work out what sequence of digits I was looking for. And because it's a nice, well-behaved sequence, it's not pi. If this was pi, it would be really, really hard. But because you know where to find any given sequence of digits in the number by skipping, you can do that. So actually, if you're going to look at it closely, this, this, this number is actually encoding all the information necessary to produce the song. That's a bit. Um, but it is just playing the song. That natural, that's a natural, naturally occurring constant and it just happens to be there. How do you make these lawyers very happy? Yes. Well, <laughs> it depends which lawyers. I guess, that, I guess they're happy regardless as long as there's controversy. And, uh, and <laughs> uh, I may have made them happy. I don't know. I like making people happy. So that's, yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah. So is this, is your algorithm yeah. somehow tuned? Is it better at finding blurred lines than, say, row, 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 row your boat? Um, it's actually just, uh, the question was, like, well, is it better for some, finding some songs than others? Uh, not really because it's more just an encoding and decoding. So this is not a, it's not going through all the numbers until it encounters it. There's not some kind of like binary thing. It's taking a list of discrete notes, which I said I do at the start because it's a bit simpler converting that into a sequence of digits and then just treating that as a natural number and jumping to that to that point. Uh, so anything, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly when I say every possible song potentially because as you, I think as you pointed out earlier, it depends what features of a song you find relevant. So it's anything that's in the image of the decoding function counts, which by my judgment is close enough to include everything that you might be interested in. Uh, so, like, uh, since we're, we're only on eight minutes, so... Oh, yeah, that's good. No, good. I've just said yeah. Um, like, the num number of voices yes. is, is uh, another another dimension, so I guess. The vo I, I did it with three voices. This is actually something that I could tune. I'm pretty sure you could define an encoding that had an arbitrary number of voices. As it happens, if you look at the source code, which is available if you want to mess with it, this has three specific voices, but I took the pragmatic decision that for the purposes of copyright jamming, three voices should be enough for anyone, as, as Bill Gates might have put it. <laughs> but I don't know if that's fun to me. And it doesn't, and only covers pitched instruments as well. That would be another another element of this particular example. Yeah. So, so if you want to try to publish this, you might have trouble. But you might be able to publish a version that filters out uh, all uh, sequences that are too close to known music. Uh, so all you need to do is get a library of known music and uh, just get uh, Get rid of all sequences, subsequences that are uh, yeah. substrings that are within a small yeah. hamming distance of a known ten note se of a published ten note sequence. Right, and you can do that automatically as long as yeah. you've had that uh, those those. Uh, yeah, your generator, that, unfortunately. Yeah. You yeah, know, the problem is when you try to send your generator, yes. your, your generator code will include all these previous uh, songs in it, so it can get rid of them. Or just uh, network access if there was a service for it. Uh, you know, it had to, it's after, you know, every time it found it, look up in the iTunes database or something with a certain distance, yeah. Yeah, does that count as being fixed in a tangible medium? So, uh, so the, the problem is that the, the yeah. uh, printed out version yes. doesn't violate any copyrights and you could, you could nail yes. down all previous stuff that way. Yes. The problem is your description of it will violate all previous copyrights yes. in order to know what to exclude. Well, it is published, just no one's looked at it yet. But yeah. <laughs> That's the other <laughs> thing, but it is pays attention. Uh, but I think it's the, the condition... Uh, the the distance between two songs, like we say, hamming distance. I think you could actually capture that as a Kolmogorov complexity problem as well, if you used a like conditional Kolmogorov complexity, where you actually used those existing songs as primitives in your encoding, because then you would just need to tran you'd start with you start with blurred lines and you'd apply transformations to it until you got to got to give it up. Sure, there, there are many transformations yeah. that people wouldn't regard as uh, similar, and you might want to get cognitive similarity of some kind. Yeah, well, that, yeah, well, tune on human yeah if you're worried about cognitive similarity, obviously, then you're into a world of much more complexity, because then you need to model the, I guess, the psychology and the listening apparatus of the people involved, yeah. Well, it sounds, it sounds like an excellent topic for further research. Um, so there's one other thing that I wanted to do just of the content that I have, and then, and then we can get back to kind of uh, maybe the conversation about it for whatever time we have left, is it? We have 10 minutes. Cool.
I'll, I'll cover something for about two and a half, three minutes and then, and then get back to that. Um, so people do actually use this to perform. So I've got my, I only just got it, this has just been printed, my Elbow Wave t-shirt on. So there's a, there's a bunch of people, I think especially in the UK, but around the world, like there's some pretty cool folks who do kind of live coding in Emacs to perform dance music, basically. Uh, which, is, which is a fantastic phenomenon. I, think, I hope it goes somewhere. It's not that old, it's only a couple of years old. So I'm not going to do what people might refer to as kind of the hardcore of uh, Algo Rave, which is to start with a blank buffer, which is obviously very creative, but takes a long while before you get anywhere interesting. So I do have some, of some, some elements I already have here. Uh, but in particular, this piece is designed to kind of have a commentary on um, uh, so we saw Dave Mer Meredith's earlier work where he had translations and clones of the same melody. That's all at the same uh, semantic level, that's just geometric transformation. So what I wanted to try to do was use transformations that kind of cross semantic boundaries because I got into this music stuff from reading the book Go to Leisure Bar. So um, what I'm going to do is take the letters G, E, B um, and use them to create a little bit of a canon where we're interpreting both the letters G, E and B as ASCII codes and playing them as MIDI uh, and as the notes themselves. And then there's kind of some elaboration I'll do on top of that. Um, and I think it can sound pretty interesting.
I think with your patience, I've slightly exceeded my allowance. So, uh, so, so we have some more questions. Yes. Um, I, I haven't, but actually, it would be it, it, it would be fairly simple. Um, uh, I think it's probably, in general, the length of the natural number grows obviously with the length of the song. So, uh, it would probably be, and even probably struggle to put that on the screen at once. I think, but yeah, I'm sure it's there. Oh yeah. Of computational analysis of Wagner was the question. Um, I don't know. I've done. Uh, some stuff around Bach because obviously Bach has a very stuff like canons, the concept of having reflections and transformation and those patterns in canons and fugues that Bach does is very repetitive. So that I think can be done quite productively. I personally don't know about Wagner. I asked him about Wagner because uh, uh, a friend of mine had a collection of books where people try to analyze how the certain melody goes from one yeah. music to string and how it's yeah. Well, I mean, so the, 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 what she was just mentioning was that there's a lot of analyses of these different composers like Wagner. I would in general expect that if there's an analysis that actually is precise enough to make sense, you could translate it into code if you had sufficient patience. So uh, it's not necessarily having to do it from scratch, you would just need to work out what's the computational equivalent of that uh, English sentence. I was just wondering, with regards to the um, the, the comments you made earlier, yeah. uh, have you or the company that you uh, work for looked at monetizing this as a method for copyright infringement lawsuits <laughs> so uh, as a tool to, to objectify these kind of claims? Um, so uh, one thing I should mention is that my day job doesn't really resemble what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love my com company a lot and we do a lot of interesting work, but uh, this isn't particularly one of them. Um, no, so I, I, neither, neither I, I, other than, the, um, other than uh, uh, using the concept to, to help get the hospitality of uh, carry on and, and similar conferences, I haven't exploited it for personal gain. Uh, 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 the actual like a differenti differentiation between songs for copyright, I think, like it's got to be expert witness kind of content, I think would actually be a genuinely interesting thing. I don't know whether you, you would, I don't know whether you would be able to get away with doing it just against the composition, because you could get people to translate the, the raw song into the composition, or maybe you'd need to do waveform analysis. But I think it's, I think it's interesting. Well, I think that just in the course of your talk, yeah. you demonstrated at least for this audience yeah. that, that, that you can represent something that we all were familiar yeah. with uh, in by this encoding scheme. Yeah. I don't see why that wouldn't work in the context of a copyright law, a copyright lawsuit either. So, it's, it's, yeah. It's based on subjective assessment. Yeah, well, you think it can't get any worse, right? But I, but uh, definitely, like the legal technique of programmers saying, "I don't see why it doesn't work this way," isn't doesn't always produce an accurate legal analysis, unfortunately. <laughs> as, as Slashdot and Hacker News and so on would, would show you very strongly. Yeah. Uh, that was great fun, and if the, if anybody wants to hear more of this kind of thing, yeah, it's a regular. At ICFP, yes. um, uh, so there's usually a, an after party at the end of ICFP with uh, a whole evening of people doing this in a club, and there will be again at ICFP this year. Yes, plug, come to yeah. come to Oxford for ICFP, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and there, there's a whole day of like this farm. It's a functional art and modelling uh, day of ICFP. It's one of the constituent conferences. So uh, generally, the performance that I'm referring to is uh, it's kind of the culmination of that. So if you're interested in not just seeing the performance, but also possibly some papers that might be more serious than mine uh, about people exploring functional programming in art. There's a whole a big, a big section of that.